Hello everyone, back to read by the Great Horn Spoon, chapter 13, A Bushel of Neckties. Sometime during the night, Cut Eye Higgins left Hangtown for parts unknown. In the days that followed, Praiseworthy's name and reputation spread through the diggings. He was pointed out to new immigrants as someone of consequence, and Jack basked in reflected glory. The truth of the matter was that Praiseworthy himself began to enjoy the notoriety. And like chameleons, the two partners changed their colors to those of the Sierra Nevadas. They wore red minor shirts and jackboots and wide-brimmed hats against the summer sun. After a week in the diggings, there was little of the butler left to be seen in Praiseworthy, unless it was the straightness of his back and the quiet reserve of his glance. And then, as if to live up to his reputation, he stopped shaving. Within a few days, he began to look decidedly fierce. Jack collected four tin cans against the day when they would stake their claim. They bought a dust-stained canvas tent at the Cheap John auction and pitched it besides Pitch Pine Billy's tent. All they lacked to go prospecting was a burrow and a grub stake of beans, bacon, flour, and coffee. They shoveled dirt and panned mud from morning till night. Pitchpine Billy taught them every trick he knew, including the setting of flea traps. After dark, they filled gold pans with soapy water and placed them beside a lighted candle stuck in the dirt floor of the tent. The candle gets the varmints to jump in, Pitch Pine Billy exclaimed. About the only thing a flea ain't learned to do is to take a bath. They hop in that soap water and drown. But candles were one dollar each, and some of the miners preferred the fleas. There were days when a man was lucky to wash out enough spangles to pay for his grub. While an ounce of gold brought sixteen dollars far away in San Francisco... It was worth a mere four dollars at the diggings, and it didn't buy much. Onions were a dollar fifty a pound. Supplies had to be freighted in, and prices were high. Salt pork sold for fifty cents at an, an ounce. Gold dust seemed more plentiful than flour. Hay was weighed out at eight cents a pound. Oh, I seen some mighty fancy prices, laughed Pitch Pine Billy, frying up a loaf of bread in his gold pan. There was a fellow come to the diggings with a jar of raisins. The boys ain't seen a raisin since they left home and their mouths began to slabber. You'd think it was caviar in the jar. Them raisins fetched their weight in gold dust. Come to four thousand dollars. Slowly, day by day, Praiseworthy and Jack added to their grub stake. They had blankets, a dozen candles, and a coffee pot. One noon, Jack pulled up a tuft of grass, and a glint of light from the roots made him gasp. A nugget! And then his yell carried from one end of the ravine to the other. A nugget! Praiseworthy dropped his gold pan, and Pitch Pine Billy squinted. Jimmy from town, who wore a mustache twisted into sharp points, came running over, and Buffalo John awoke from a sound sleep. Soon a dozen miners had left their claims to stand around and admire Jack's catch. The lump of gold was the size of an acorn. It was trapped in the fine grass roots like a fly in a spider's web. Maybe it'll buy us a burrow, Jack grinned. Well, I don't know, smiled Pitch Pine Billy, the tail of a jackass anyway. Buffalo John pulled the bandana off his head and polished the nugget. The miners passed it around, holding it up to the sun to watch it shine, and from that moment on it became no known as Jamoka Jack's Nugget. The night Praiseworthy and Jack and Pitch Pine Billy went to town for supper. There was a letter waiting at the hotel from Dr. Buckby. It was written in a shaky hand. My dear friends, your letter finds me weakened by the yellow fever from Panama, and I can barely hold this pen steady. Curse that Higgins fellow and the gang of highway men who you I'm sorry, it's hard to read. Of highway men you wrote right of. Since I cannot leave my bed, please act as my agent in the matter. If you are able to recover my map, 
I will make you partners in the mine 50-50 and quickly. I lay, I beg of you before all is lost. Praiseworthy finished reading the letter and folded it thoughtfully. A generous offer, he said to Jack. Half interest in a gold mine. Jack's yellow eyebrows lifted. All they had to do was get on the trail of those road agents. We'll need guns, he said quickly. A four-shooter would fit fine in his belt alongside his horn spoon and buckskin pouch. Maybe he could trade his nugget for a pistol. Praiseworthy scratched through the stubble growing out on his face. What we need is a burrow. A burrow to chase outlaws, said Jack. Praiseworthy put the letter in his shirt pocket. He shook his head. We've no time for such speculations. First, those vultures no doubt ripped open Cut Eye Higgins' coat and discovered the map. Second, they may have already located the mine by now. Maps, Pitch Pine Billy laughed. Why, there is so many maps floating around the diggings, you could paper a room with them. Boys, let's eat. Um, they ordered hangtown fries, platters of bacon, canned oysters, and eggs. Praiseworthy turned to Jack. What do you want to drink? Jack glanced up at the waiter. Coffee, he said. Coffee, sir, with a few acorns ground up. After dinner, Praiseworthy stayed behind in the hotel lobby to reply to Doc Dr. Buckby's letter. Jack and Pitch Pine Billy went wandering along the street to see the sights. The auction bell began to clang. Maybe Cheap John would have pistols to sell, Jack thought. Let's go, he said. Don't mind, said Pitch Pine Billy. The auctioneer placed a keg of salt butter outside the brightly lit tent, and the miners gathered round this delicacy like flies. They unclasped their jackknives and carved off butter shavings and ate them off their blades. Between the ringing of the bell and the free butter, a crowd had formed and the sale began. Frenchmen rubbed shoulders with Sonorians and Chileans, with Germans and Missourians, with Yankees and Englishmen, with Kansas from the Sandwich Islands. There were sailors who had deserted their ships to run off to the mines, and soldiers who had left their garrisons at Monterey and San Francisco. The auctioneer mounted a barrel at the rear of the tent. He was a paunchy man in an open vest and a plug hat. What do you what do you take for that hat, cheap John? Someone yelled. Ain't for sale, said the auctioneer. But I got ten pounds of Chinese sugar, that is. What am what am I bid, gents? Who'll give me a dollar a pound? Dollar, 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 I got a dollar. Who give me a dollar and a half? Half, half, two dollars. Am I bid two dollars, boys? Two, two. Dos pesos, said a Spaniard with silver buttons down his trouser legs. Jack waded through the sale of the sugar, a wheelbarrow, tin pans, butcher knives, and a sack of dried apples. The auctioneer seemed to have no guns. The miners stood around whittling and enjoying themselves. I got a bushel of neckties sent here by mistake, boys, said the cheap John. They'd fetch a dollar apiece back in the States. What do you give me for the lot? Am I bid ten dollars? Am I bid nine dollars? Nine, nine? The miners stood grinning and whittling and silent. At that moment, Jimmy from town spied Jack and Pitch Pine Billy. Let's go get something to eat, he said. My stomach feels like a cat in Hades without claws. Nine, 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 called the auctioneer. We're done, said Pitch Pine Billy. Done what? asked Jimmy from town, twisting the ends of his mustache hungrily. Eight, said Jack. Eight, 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 called the auctioneer. I'm bid eight dollars by the young fellow with yellow eyebrows, sold for eight dollars. Jack stood as if struck by lightning. The miners began to chuckle. Looks like you bought yourself a bushel of neckties, Jamoka Jack, laughed Pitch Pine Billy. But I said eight. Not eight, he protested. That's what I heard you say, eight, answered the cheap John, pushing the plug hat to the back of his head. A-T-E. We ain't munch on spelling around here. It was clear to everyone that the auctioneer hadn't expected to be able to sell the neckties at all. You ain't going back on your word, are you? 
Can't do that, whispered Pitch Pine Billy. I'd rather see you break your leg than your word, boy. Pay up. The auctioneer was grinning. Why, you got them ties dirt cheap. Of course, we ain't much on tie wearing here at the diggings, except to be buried in, and he burst out laughing. The miners looked up upon looked up upon the affair as harmless fun. Might be able to stuff a pillow with them, someone called out. Tie knot him together and lasso chickens. Jack stepped up to the gold scale and pulled the buckskin pouch from his belt. The nugget tumbled out. He borrowed a knife and carved half of it away, bit by bit. It hurt. He clamped his jaws with anger. Then he picked up the bushel of neckties and worked his way through the crowd to the street. Ain't so sure I even want to be buried in one of them things, a miner laughed. Praiseworthy was coming along the street from the hotel and Jack could barely face him. He had cut two ounces of his gold nugget that might have gone toward their grub stake. Or a gun. Even Pitch Pine Billy and Jimmy from town were chuckling. What have you got there? Praiseworthy asked, raising an eyebrow. Neckties, Jack muttered. A whole bushel of them. Praiseworthy raised his other eyebrow. Neckties? Yes, sir. Jimmy from town loosened his gold pouch. I guess it was my fault, he smiled. I'll pay you for them ties, Jamoka Jack, as long as you don't make me wear one. Me either, grinned Pitch Pine Billy. Praiseworthy held up his hand. Put away your dust, he looked at Jack. That was a fine purchase, he smiled. A brilliant purchase. Jack gazed up at Praiseworthy. What? We'll buy our mountain canary with neckties. Pitch Pine Billy crimped an eye. You, got, you gone out of your head, Bullwhip? Why, you couldn't give them things away in Hangtown. The only necktie you can get on a man is made out of rope. Praiseworthy scratched his short whiskers. They were an itchy at an itchy stage. He smiled, half shuddering an eye. Unless I miss my guess, every man in the diggins will come begging for a necktie in a day or two. They'll fight to get one. He picked up the bushel basket and swung it to his shoulder. Come along, partner. The next morning, Praiseworthy and Jack helped Pitch Pine Billy dig a coyote hole. Once we hit bedrock, there's no telling the riches down there, the miner declared. The spangles keep working and sifting through the ground, earthquakes and all. It may take them 10,000 and one years to reach the bedrock, but that stops them. By late afternoon, the big hole was deeper than Praiseworthy's head. They rigged up a rope and lifted out dirt by the bucketful. There were men all along the diggings, coyote coyoteing for gold, and some of the shafts were as deep as wells. Jack took his turn at the bottom of the hole, filling buckets that were emptied into the long tom. The long tom was a wooden sluice box set in the stream. Rushing, washed, rushing water washed the dirt along a trough, and the bits of gold were trapped in iron riffles along the bottom. Praiseworthy kept silent about the neckties. Even by the end of the next day, there was no rush to buy them, as he had predicted, but he remained unconcerned. Jack wondered if Praiseworthy had merely been trying to spare his feelings after the ridiculous purchase he made. He was glad to forget it and said no more. The following morning, a delegation of three men appeared on Pitch Pine Billy's claim. Jack recognized Mr. Jonas T. Fletcher at once. The undertaker had brought two hangtown merchants with him. They came along, they came looking for Praiseworthy, who was at the bottom of the coyote hole. Jack and Pitchpine Billy hold, hauled him out on a rope, and Praiseworthy looked as if he had been dipped in dust. It clung to his eyelashes as he blinked. If bedrock's any deeper, he said to Pitchpine Billy, we'll be digging for gold in China. Bull whip, said the undertaker. You got to uphold the fair name of Hangtown. What's that? We've just been delivered a challenge. Praiseworthy began beating the dirt out of his slouch hat. Is that so? Yep. A fellow over at Grizzly Flats has heard about you. He says he can whip you. Jack looked up. Praiseworthy hardly blinked an eye. He merely continued knocking the dust out of his hat. Is that so? He said. Yep. 
Of course, he don't know B from a bull's foot to make a statement like that. He ain't exactly bright, although I understand he can write his own name if you give him time enough. But he is a regular big fellow. The mountain ox, they call him. Well, how about it? It doesn't sound like a fair match, said Praiseworthy. The undertaker nodded. He does have you on height and weight and reach and general meanness, I suppose. That's not what I meant, said Praiseworthy. It wouldn't be a fair fight for him. The three gentlemen from Hangtown responded with a blank look. Look, how's that? Even Jack was startled by Praiseworthy's declaration. The mountain ox sounded enormous. Praiseworthy wouldn't have a chance. He had begun to believe his own reputation. From what you tell me, gentlemen, said Praiseworthy, the man can barely read and write. He'll be at a decided disadvantage. Pitchpine Billy pulled his hat down over his ears. Bull whip. Will you tell me what reading and writing has, has got to do with a bare knuckle fight match? I suppose that remains to be seen. Then you'll fight him, the undertaker grinned. Not by choice, sir, said Praiseworthy, but if the fair name of Hangtown is at stake, I suppose I must. The delegation smiled. How about next Tuesday? Impossible. By next Tuesday, we'll have our burrow and grub stake and be far away prospecting. My partner and I have a fortune to make and time is running out. We'll be returning this way by the middle of August at the very latest. You can plan the match for the 15th, sir. The three gentlemen from Hangtown nodded and departed. Jack gazed at Praiseworthy as if, in a com if a complete stranger had been hiding through the years under the elegant manners of a butler. He was enchanted. But Pitchpine Billy whipped off his hat and jumped on it. Bullwhip, he snorted. You've gone and lost your reason. Before the 15th of next month shows up, you better make out your last will and testament. Jack had just lowered himself into the coyote hole when a sudden excitement spread through the diggings and he pulled himself out again. There was a shout of voices back and forth across the stream from claim to claim. Old Quartz Jackson is back, and he's brought his new missus with him. Men dropped their shovels and gold pans and abandoned their long toms. Miners crawled out of coyote holes. What's that? Him and the lady is putting up at the hotel. The excitement even touched Pitch Pine Billy. Boys, he said to Praiseworthy and Jack, I ain't seen a lady in so long I nearly forgot what they look like. Praiseworthy rested his arms on the handle of his shovel and grinned. He gave Jack a nod. This is the day we've been waiting for, partner. Watch and see. Pitchpine Billy scowled. Well, don't just stand there. Look at you both. Dirt sticking out on you like you ain't had a bath all year. Why, it's a disgrace. I'm ashamed of you. You heard what they said. There's a lady in town. Within five minutes, miners were everywhere along the stream, scrubbing and shouting and planning to go to town. Pitchpine Billy waded in with his clothes on and kept dumping hatloads of water over his head. Later, shirts and trousers could be seen on every bush drying out in the mountain heat. Men stood at mirrors, tacked to trees, and got out their straight razors. Half a dozen familiar beards disappeared. Others were trimmed and shortened. Praiseworthy took his time. When he and Jack emerged from their canvas tent, they were wearing bright green neckties. Pitchpine Billy stood fluffing out his beard. He stopped and stared. Help yourself, said Praiseworthy. That is, if it's all right with my partner. It's fine with me, said Jack. Pitchpine Billy grinned. Don't mind if I do. The neckties were so bright they could be seen across the river. Soon, the miners who had laughed at Jack the night of the auction were swarming about the bushel basket. I'll give you a pinch of dust for one of them neckties, Jamoka Jack. I'll give you two pinches. Pinch, Pitch Pine Billy was laughing. Don't fight, boys. Just get in line there. Looks like Jamoka Jack has cornered the necktie market. He caught you sleeping, didn't he? Just hold your pouches open and I'll pinch out the gold since I got the biggest thumbs in the diggings. Praiseworthy stood idly by with his foot on his stump and lit a long nine cigar. Within 20 minutes, the basket was empty. Every necktie was gone. 
Pitchpine Billy pulled the strings on Jack's buckskin pouch and handed it over. It was heavy as a plummet. Jack weighed it in his hand and tossed the pouch to Praiseworthy. That ought to get us a burrow, he grinned, and maybe a gun, Praiseworthy said, taking the heft of it. He tossed the pouch back. Yes, sir, that cheap John had better learn B from a bull's foot to get the better of Jamoka Jack. Gents, let's go to town. The miners had formed a crowd outside the Empire Hotel, and when Quartz Jackson brought his lady out onto the porch, the miners whipped off their hats as if it were the United States flag they were looking at. By the great horn spoon, Pitch Pine Billy muttered in awe, a genuine woman. She had sparkling eyes and a smile for everyone. Quartz Jackson wore a vest with a watch chain across it and looked proud enough to burst. We freighted up some cut lumber, he said. The missus and me, we're going to build a cabin, and you boys are always welcome to drop in for tea. Ain't that right, Hannah? Hannah, Pitch, Point, Pitch Pine Billy muttered. Ain't that the purtiest name you ever heard? Quartz Jackson looked over the crowd. He recognized Praiseworthy and Jack and gave them a nod. Step boy, up, boys, I'll introduce you. Make it fast before you strangle in those neckties. And that is the end of chapter 13. And come back tomorrow when we will read chapter 14, The Prospectors. See you guys later.